This video has two forest-related topics, 5.2 and 5.17, clear-cutting and sustainable forestry. For thousands of years, wood has been used as a building material for structures, transportation like canoes, and as a medium for artistic expression. It's relatively cheap, grows practically everywhere, and for most of history, has been harvested without the use of specialized or mechanical tools. But starting with the Industrial Revolution, and especially in the 20th century, tree harvesting and the subsequent deforestation of land accelerated dramatically. Forested land is harvested for reasons other than the acquisition of building materials, such as road building and space for home and business construction. Sustainable practices in forest management and timber harvesting are necessary to promote healthy ecosystems and to ensure the future availability of forest resources. Approximately one-third of Earth's land masses are covered by forest. While there is no formal, universally agreed-upon definition of what a forest is, the most common use describes an area of land dominated by trees. They can be classified based on what types of trees are found there. Forested land provides a number of ecosystem services, including oxygen production, filtering out certain pollutants out of the air, such as nitrogen and sulfur oxides, and the sequestration of carbon. Oh, and don't forget that nearly 80% of all land animals and plants reside in forests. Soil erosion in forests is practically non-existent thanks to the extensive root systems of trees that help to stabilize and bind together the soil. The number one reason behind the harvesting of timber is the production of lumber. In the United States, lumber is the building material used for the construction of nine out of every ten homes. But not all kinds of trees are harvested for the same purpose. Growing in different regions around the world, different species of wood are useful for different reasons. Softwoods like pine are most commonly used in construction whereas hardwoods like oak and walnut are more often used in furniture construction. More rare, beautiful, and expensive hardwoods like ebony, mahogany, and rosewood are most often used for decorative or ornamental purposes. Forests provide more than just lumber. The sugar maple tree, extensive throughout Canada, provides a sap which is refined into maple syrup. Other food products, such as tree nuts like walnuts, hazelnuts, and almonds, are harvested directly from trees, whereas the trees themselves provide a habitat for a variety of edible fungal species. Since timber is the primary resource harvested from forests, let's take a look at a few common harvesting methods. The simplest method is self-defining. It's called clear-cutting. Clear cutting involves the removal of every single tree in a given area. Because this method yields the greatest quantity of material, it is the most economically lucrative for the company engaging in the practice. However, along with the loss of habitat and habitat fragmentation, the rate of soil erosion increases since tree roots are no longer stabilizing the soil. Also, without the benefit of shade, the water temperature of creeks and streams will increase, perhaps beyond the range of tolerance of the aquatic species living in them. Selective cutting, which is more time intensive and expensive, involves the removal of a small number of fully grown trees. Although the economic gain from this method of harvesting is significantly less than clear cutting, and may not meet the market's need for building materials, it does allow for more light to reach the ground, promoting the growth of newer and smaller trees, and largely avoids the negative consequences of clear cutting. Shelter wood cutting is sometimes described as an intermediate 
between clear cutting and selective cutting. In shelter wood cutting, sections of forested area are harvested, leaving behind collections of large mature trees. Although still not as profitable as clear cutting, the result is an area of land where enough trees remain to mitigate soil erosion and an increase in water temperature. As is true with sustainable practices for any resource, sustainable forestry practices are important in ensuring the future availability of forest resources. Although the world is not likely to meet the goal set forth by the United Nations Strategic Plan for Forests to increase forest land by 3% by 2030, the rate of forest loss globally has decreased since the 1990s. Some countries have been successful in increasing forest cover, but others, mainly in the tropics, have seen the greatest loss in forest land. On a much smaller and often local scale, the reclaimed lumber industry makes use of practices to reuse old building materials whenever possible. More intensive than harvesting new timber, the use of reclaimed lumber has increased and decreased substantially over the last 40 years. Recent introductions to the market include alternatives to wood products such as bamboo, hemp, and human-made composites. Although they still play a small part in slowing and reducing forest loss, they have benefited from an increase in popularity, which helps to drive down their price. Perhaps one of the easiest and most effective ways of conserving forests is to establish protected areas. 12.4% of the world's forests and 8.5% of forest land in the U.S. is protected by laws and regulations. The area of protected forest in the U.S. is equivalent to the size of Texas. Other than human activity, fire is arguably one of the most destructive events that threatens forests. Up until the late 1960s, forest management practices and policies were focused at suppressing and eliminating all fires as quickly as possible. That practice was all but abandoned after a series of catastrophic fires in Yellowstone National Park in the late 80s burned down over a third of the park. Disallowing the naturally caused by lightning fires led to the buildup of highly combustible fuels such as pine needles, fallen logs, and leaf litter. Following those fires, however, the practice of prescribed burns has moved to the forefront of the collection of strategies used to manage and promote healthy forests. We're now going to watch a mashup of a couple videos on this concept, one from the U.S. Forestry Service and the other from the Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife. Fire has always been a part of the environment. Under the right conditions, fire can even provide important benefits to the health of a forest or grassland. However, in recent years, wildfire seasons have grown longer and more destructive. The Forest Service and other land management agencies are working together with local communities to reduce the threat of wildfires and help communities become more prepared and resilient. Prescribed burning is one of the most important tools land managers have to do this. A prescribed burn is a planned, low-intensity fire conducted by trained professionals who control the conditions of the burn. Prescribed burns are shorter in duration and conducted under weather conditions that minimize the impacts of smoke to the public. Today, many natural areas are overgrown and dense with thin trees, too much brush, and too many dried leaves, twigs, and needles. When fire occurs in these areas, either from lightning or human activity, it can spread quickly and threaten nearby communities. Conducting prescribed burns in areas like these at the right time and under the right conditions not only improves forest health, but reduces the threat of future wildfires and also gives firefighters safer places to work if fire does occur. 
Welcome to the Bastrop State Park Complex, which includes Bastrop and Boucher State Parks. Some of the areas of the park have been managed with prescribed burns. Those are burns conducted under ideal weather and time conditions to rejuvenate the forest for the benefit of the forest and its wildlife. However, many areas have not had a prescribed burn in the history of the park. Some characteristics of unburned forest include an abundance of fallen logs and dead brush, volatile shrubs, and ladder fuels. Ladder fuels are brush, shrubs, and other vegetation that allow flames to climb up into the canopy of the forest. There are many benefits to prescribed fire, including reducing the severity of future wildfire, improving habitat for wildlife, and opening up gaps in the tree cover so new seeds can grow and replenish the forest. In 2011, Bastrop State Park and surrounding areas experienced a catastrophic wildfire. This area was burned as part of a prescribed fire a few years before the catastrophic wildfire of 2011. This area was not. Almost half of the pines in this area survived. Native little blue stem grass carpets the forest floor, and it's perfect for turkey, quail, woodpeckers, the endangered Houston toad, and many other species of wildlife. 100% of the loblolly pine trees here died as a result of the fire. Hardwoods are invading. The severe fire burned nearly all the dormant seeds in the soil. And so hardy, widespread species like poverty weed and exotic invasive grasses, weeds, are the dominant plants. Very few pine saplings can be found here, and invasive wildlife, especially the red imported fire ant, are taking up residence. Prescribed fire restores good habitat for wildlife. Prescribed fire is good for native grasses, shrubs, wildflowers, and trees. Prescribed fire saves forests. Pests and infectious diseases are the biggest biotic threats to forests, outside of humans, of course. Invasive species are especially pernicious since trees and other species of plant don't have any defense mechanisms with which to protect themselves. Chestnut blight, caused by a fungal infection, is estimated to have killed approximately 4 billion trees in the United States and Europe in just under a century. The bronze birch borer is an insect that damages the internal transport network for water and nutrients in birch trees, ultimately killing them. In order to protect forests and promote their health, a variety of strategies are used. Preventative measures include actions that allow for the detection and diagnosis of potential threats. Trees that are infected or infested can be identified and removed to prevent the infection or infestation from spreading to other trees. Although chemical pesticides are rarely used in a widespread preemptive fashion anymore, they are still used in a way that focuses their use only when it is necessary. Although uncommon due to the economic cost, biological controls include the release of predator species of pests. More often used biological control methods requires the management of a forest and its surrounding area to promote the natural enemies of pest species. That concludes this look into forests and forest resources. Thank you and take care.